the book of Acts. It's the very first chapter, kind of two, two sections in there. It's, it's verses 15 to 17, and then 21 to 26. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when Jesus was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Lord, we've heard your word read. Now, let us hear you unpack and apply this word to our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This, um, this might be a confusing time to read this passage, but it, it actually, no, normally I'd probably be, be preaching on the Ascension passage, but technically that happened on Thursday, and this little obscure section of scripture is one I think that we skip over in favor of either leaning back on Ascension or leaning forward to Pentecost. But there's a very important momentous shift that happens in this passage that I think we should attend to. And it's about decision making. So the, the first thing I want to just ask everybody is take a second to think about what is the last important decision you made. Maybe it was before COVID or during COVID. Maybe it's something about after COVID. Uh, maybe it involves a move or a different job. Maybe starting a family or getting married. And then, how did you make that decision? Did you make it on your own? Did you do a ton of research? Did you make it really quick? Did you consult a bunch of people? Did you pray? We make hundreds of decisions, really probably every day, and most of them we're not even really conscious of. Occasionally we make some big momentous decisions. We make them as individuals. We make them as communities. Our, our country has a democratic system where we make a lot of the decisions by a vote. And in the church, the church makes decisions. And some churches are very hierarchical. So one person at the top makes a decision. Some churches are more congregational. They, the whole congregation has to vote. And our system is, I guess, what you'd call representative. You've elected session members and deacons to, to make decisions and to you know, enact ministries on your behalf. In the ancient world, with the people of God, they had some very specific decision-making um, traditions. And, and it, one, one starts all the way back in Exodus, when God is, has instructed Moses how to build um, this tabernacle and all of the accoutrements that go with it, one of the things that needed to be made was Aaron's breastplate, within which were two stones, the Urim and the Tumen, kind of a lighter stone and a darker stone, that Aaron would actually roll in, 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 um, in response to a yes or no question before God. And the idea was that this casting lots before the Lord would yield um, the, the God's will, what God wanted. This is how Joshua apportioned territory to the 12 tribes in the Promised Land. 
This is how Saul was chosen as king. David used this decision-making type. And it's um, so common that in Proverbs, there's even a saying about it. The lot is cast into the lap, but the decision is the Lord's alone. In this little section of scripture, that's what the disciples are doing. Uh, this is the tradition, to, to, to pray and then um, cast the lots. And, and that's how Matthias was chosen. But after, right after this, this, um, this scene, something happens that's going to change the way they make decisions going forward. And that's Pentecost, which Nick is going to preach about next week. But, so they're, they're praying, they're casting lots, Matthias is chosen. And they seem satisfied with this decision, although we never hear about Matthias again. So, it's interesting and I think um, edifying and, and, and an important thing for us to ponder as the people of God. How do we make decisions? And post-Pentecost decision making is really the tradition we're in now. The, um, a good example would be since, since um, session was tasked as your representatives to make decisions, well, they recently made a decision to, to hire an interim. But you know, it wasn't that easy, and they didn't cast lots. They didn't roll the dice to decide who we were going to hire. There was a lot of um, discussion and a lot of debate, and, and they looked at more than one person, and there was interviews. And in all of the gifts that the Spirit poured out at Pentecost on all of us, they were brought to bear as we as one body, as session as one body, made this decision. And I, I think it's important for, for the congregation to know that a very wise elder, right before we were starting to vote, said, stop, we need to pray. And so I prayed that God would incline our hearts in, towards the person that he thought would be a good leader for us. And I'm happy to say that our, our decision after that prayer was unanimous. Everyone's heart felt inclined in the same direction. Because with the coming of Pentecost, we have gifts that, that we can bring to bear on making decisions. We have discernment. Uh, we have all the gifts that the Spirit pours out. And we have to bring those together in the unity of the body of Christ for them to all be effective and, and helpful in making a decision. And then we have, to, we have to activate the Spirit. We have to ask the Spirit to come and in, incline our hearts as, as one body. And that, that was some um, sessions process for hiring the interim. And um, they're going to be engaged in, that, in a similar process later today when they decide when and how we'll open the church for in-person worship. When I was feeling the call to go to seminary, I really thought I was sure, but I wasn't 100% sure. And I felt like the Spirit was calling me. And so I prayed a lot. But I also asked a lot of people to pray for me because I didn't, I didn't think I had all the discernment on my own that I needed to make a good choice. I consulted my friends, my spouse, people that knew me. And um, bit by bit, I felt empowered to make the decision to go. And now that I look back, I can see that I, I really do believe that it was a good decision. It was part of God's plan. Certainly, God has used that decision I made. And I think that there's, as I've been thinking about this, I've been realizing how, how um, we need to be much more uh, intentional and present with how we make decisions in the church. These, these disciples who had watched Jesus ascended, ascend into heaven, and then they cast lots to elect Matthias and replace Judas. We never see that done again in the, in the record of the New Testament. They've been given an entirely new way 
to make decisions. But it's interesting because I think we sometimes get caught up in, is it the right decision or is that a wrong? Is this a good decision or a bad decision? And I wonder, honestly, whether if, if, just, if uh, justice had been chosen, or let's see, th this one guy's got three names, so he gets confusing. So it was either Barsabbas, also known as, <laughs> I can't even remember, Barsabbas. Um, wait, I've got to find this because it's just so funny that he's got three names. Barsabbas, Justice, Matthias. He has three whole names. I have no idea why it was so important to record all three in this scripture. But or Joseph, Barsabbas, and, and Justice. It, what if he'd been chosen? I mean, would it have really mattered? Was it more important that the disciples we're given this new way to make decisions. Because even though Judas made a terrible decision to, to betray his Lord and Savior and ours, it did not stop God's plan of salvation. And so I kind of hold that intention with this wonderful scripture in Isaiah, this prophecy that I believe what became revealed and became true at the coming of Pentecost. And it's from Isaiah 30. And here's the, here's the promise. Truly, O people in Zion, inhabitants of Jerusalem, you shall weep no more. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Though the Lord may give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore but your eyes shall see your teacher. And when you turn to the right, or when you turn to the left, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I've always found that to be a very mysterious scripture, but holding an intention with this particular scripture in, in Acts helps me understand that maybe sometimes we, we, we simply have to make decisions as individuals and as communities and as the church. But maybe we, we have to have more confidence that when, as we incorporate Christ's body in the world, and as we make decisions, that we have God with us. And so even if we make a poor decision, God remains with us. You know, the disciples go on to make a ton of decisions, big and small. And they make, they make them now as the body of Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they've passed that tradition down to us today. They didn't always see how those decisions fit into God's great plan of salvation, God's plan to change the world. And neither, neither will we. And so I look back on some of the decisions that we've made here at Grace Church that have sometimes been contentious. There was the, the decision to build the organ, which I hear was quite, quite a contentious time, or to build the education wing, or the, the decision to support Black Lives Matter, or, or come alongside Asian American and Pacific Islanders um, to, to support missions. We've made these, these decisions time and time again. And, and I think that as we, as we look back, yes, many of them have been, I believe, good decisions, but God's been with us in it, and God's in charge of taking all these little decisions that he has actually delegated to humanity, to his people, to the disciples of Christ, to make, that God will, will remain with us in all of our decisions and work them for our good and work them for the good of creation. Because the call on our congregation and the call on the, the whole church of Jesus Christ is to bring our spirit inclinable hearts and the Holy Spirit discernment about the will of God, not just into the church, but out into the public square. Because we are to, to bring this extraordinary decision-making capacity um, that involves God's own spirit into everything around us, into all the decision-making that goes on in the world. Because 
you look at some of the decisions that are going on around the world, and it's as if people are just rolling the dice, are just saying, okay, pick one. And, and so we have to be confident that the decisions that we make in and outside the church make a difference. They make a, a difference because Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But Jesus has now offered the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we make decisions, big and small, we can be confident and feel a sense of freedom because these decisions are in the hands of a God who has a plan. And truly, these little decisions that we aren't sure about, they may be accomplishing more than any of us can imagine or dream of. And so pray for the session today, and, um, and remember to, as you make decisions, don't do them alone. And don't even do them with God, but include your community because something happens in the body of Christ when we bring all that we have to bear in, in, in making decisions. And so may God have mercy on us as we do the best we can. Amen.